Hello and welcome. Welcome to a very interesting panel, at least for any of us who are either based in Malta or have business to, to do in Malta, which is practically all of us in this room. I personally find this to be a very interesting but important uh, strategic conversation to have. Uh, we have some of the best minds in the industry to help us uh, talk about our current situation, which is essentially um, the grey situation, right? We can't talk about the G word a lot, but we, are, we can talk about it here, and importantly, we should, because it affects us as gaming professionals, but especially any one of us who touch fintech as well. Um, as you all know, this, uh, four months ago, there was a, uh, a grey listing on Malta, specifically with regards to its uh, banking practices. We should talk about that today and understand, importantly, the impact on us as, uh, as professionals, but also on the industry, and possibly to find some ways to get out of this sooner rather than later. I'm joined by, on the very uh, right-hand side, Angelo Dali. He's a very well-known entrepreneur in Malta. Good friend. Good to see you again, Angelo. Uh, Russell Mifsud, um, who deals with M&A in KPMG. Um, I've also dealt with him on the, the buy side of a few assets I've been selling. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Morton yesterday. He's a, a legal lawyer for Nord. Um, I can talk a bit about the legal aspect as well. And we're very privileged to also have Alfred Zamit from the FIAU, which essentially is, uh, is the watchdog in Malta around, around anti-money laundering and illegal practices. Gentlemen, good to, good to have you here. I want to start with, with an open question, right? So obviously, grey listing. Um, I had... I had lunch with a good friend of mine who runs a CSP in Malta a week ago, and he said, look, honestly speaking, Joe, business has never been better. We're still setting up companies. We're still building a lot of top codes. We are obviously looking to put on business, but I am concerned about what the short term and possibly the, the medium term uh, aspects of, of Malta will do for us because it, it impacts our livelihood as a business. And I kind of resonate with that because I personally have seen the amount of DD, the, the amount of due diligence, the amount of audit work increase almost exponentially over the last four months as a result of this flag. Um, are you seeing this, uh, before I talk to, uh, to Alfred, are you seeing this, Angelo, on, on your aspects with, with uh, the, the funding that you're looking for in terms of FDI, foreign direct investment? Well, to, to be honest with you, I mean, uh, we were very worried about this, especially when this happened. And, uh, it hasn't impacted, well, my company is focusing on AI mostly, so it didn't actually impact our FDI capabilities that much. We still manage to raise investment. We do get questions occasionally. Where it has impacted us is actually when dealing with the banks. It has been very, very difficult operationally. It has actually increased the amount of, you know, um, due diligence that you get asked about every transaction. So we did have to spend more time, and it, it has impacted us negatively there. But not to that biggest extent that we actually were worried. So in terms of investment, we still managed to raise investment. Um, we didn't really get that many questions. We did get a few comments there and here. Now we're going to, in this case, we're going to do a Series A next year. So I think that is when it may actually impact us. So that, that is something that is a bit of a worry. But I think I do have faith that Malta will actually get out of this. So I, I think, yeah, I think so. I think that, the, yeah, but the compliance is in fact, I mean, a burden. And uh, I think that this has to be taken into account into the burden that is being placed on, yep. on Maltese businesses, especially the ones that have been set up um, by local entrepreneurs who have to kind of be, you know, based here. And sometimes you get these questions which may seem to be a little bit too aggressive. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, let's not overdo it. But on the other hand, we, I know that we need to comply. Yeah, the hard way, yes. Um, what's your experience, Russell? I think essentially what it presents us with is an element of uncertainty. I mean, even grey listing aside, you look at COVID, you look at the fallback then of, of, of Brexit, there is uncertainty that we see at investment level, um, at regulatory level then as well. I think when it comes down to actually experiencing it firsthand, there is sometimes a lag that you see when it comes down to assessing what that impact has specifically been on investment. Um, 
an element perhaps of confounding, once again linking it to COVID, trying to understand the linkage directly to that and what impact that may have had on things. And, um, and yeah, essentially I think it's um, the opportunity cost as well, it's hard to measure itself because we may be coming up and assuming that we've seen a, either an increase or a drop, but we can't capture then the opportunity cost itself of what a company would have otherwise done had the grey listing not happened. So mm -hmm. it's hard to capture that element. Yeah, I think look, there's a momentum play here. One of the biggest aspects, and we'll talk about this over the course of this panel, one of the biggest challenges is momentum, right? Right now we enjoy good momentum. Malta has actually been one of the most resilient economies in, in, in COVID. Um, and I think we're still enjoying that momentum as a result. We're still seeing startups setting up here. We're still seeing uh, companies being sold here, right? So I think that's going to continue in the short term. Why? Because we have a strong momentum play. Where that starts to become a problem is with an aspect of sentiment, right? And this is what I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to discuss because um, Ernst & Young released a report uh, yesterday, right? And arguably, right, it was just done a few weeks after the grey listing. But one of the biggest um, uh, visible metrics, right, was the top line number around foreign direct investment, right? And it seemed like across the board, there was almost like a 40% drop, if I remember correctly, around uh, FDI, which essentially means that investors are going to be more reticent, at least in the short term, to invest capital. Alfred, what, what's your thoughts on, on, on the impact itself? How has it impacted FIU? How, where, where are you right now? What do you see as, as the short, medium term uh, market? Okay, well, how has it impacted the FIU? Um, if, if one just has a look at the action points given to Malta by the FATF, you know, the FIU is mentioned, I think, three times in those action points. Mm -hmm. So, as you can imagine, there's a lot for us to do. So, I mean, how has it impacted the FIU itself? Where we're obviously fully focused on, on implementing, you know, the actions that we need to work on to get off the grey list as soon as possible. So there's a tremendous amount of work doing, in fact, um, sort of we're, 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 we're really um, working flat out, you know, and, and taking this very seriously. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, it, is, it is hard to say exactly what will happen because I think, you know, what one must keep in mind is that this is not, you know, a, a mathematical examination where you can sit down and just w work out the sum and, and if one plus one equals two, then you're sure that you got it right. But there's an element of subjectivity. Um, so, you, you know, we're, we're working very closely with the FATF. We have already reported to the FATF and, and we're going through the sort of the first round of reporting. I think we've, we've had um, good feedback from the FATF when it comes to what, what actions we're working on to, to address the FATF action plan. Let's keep in mind always the FATF doesn't tell you how to address a problem. Yeah. It just says you need to work on something, but then it's up to you to figure out what you need to do, you know, to, to really um, work, work on that. So it's kind of an open-ended kind of problem, yeah. right? They tell you what the problem is and then it's up to you to kind of... Exactly. Figure. So essentially, you know, you have to do your best, work as hard as you can, try and make sure that what you're doing is actually addressing the problems and then, ju and then just hope for the best, really. So... <laughs> Sadly, that's the case, um, which I think we're, we all find ourselves in it. Morten, what's, what's your experience with dealing with, uh, with jurisdictions that are, have either been grey-listed or even your experience with Malta in the few months you've been uh, exposed to a grey-listing, if that makes sense? Yeah, so there was, you mentioned that there's an increased uh, focus on compliance and compliance task, and I think that is something we see in all jurisdictions, not only in Malta, and, and maybe uh, because uh, the recommendations from FATF, Malta was a bit, I mean, too, too low on, on, on that side. Uh, but it's something you see everywhere, and uh, we, I'm working with other jurisdictions where FATF reviews are coming up, and it's something that's taken really, really seriously. And you always see uh, the regulators ramping up uh, efforts uh, because they're, they're scared of, of what's coming and, and they will also impose, uh, you know, uh, investigations on, on, uh, on, on the operators. So, so it's, it's, it's really not uncommon uh, to see that. Thank you very much. If I may just jump in really quickly. I mean, obviously from our point of view, when it comes to the impact on, 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 on due diligence, we have actually clarified that from mm -hmm. a local perspective, nothing really has changed. Yeah. Obviously what is happening is that many other jurisdictions and, 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 and banks and, and other um, uh, you know, um, uh, institutions and, and foreign jurisdictions are sometimes required to you know, um, uh, apply sort of enhanced due diligence measures. It is not always the case. Actually, the FATF 
doesn't even call for that. Um, uh, but some countries, inc you know, including ourselves, Malta, sort of went beyond the standard and, and when dealing with an, ent an entity that is listed, that is in a, in a country that is uh, grey listed, then sort of they have to apply due diligence. So obviously, I mean, from our end, and we have been having discussion with, with a number of subject persons in Malta, such as banks and even gaming companies, we always, you know, advise the very obvious is, listen, be cooperative as much as possible, you know, um, ensure that you provide any information. And for us, we believe it is also very important for institutions who are located overseas to understand the reasons why, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we've been great listed, which is obviously in the public domain, and, and the FATF listed exactly what the issues are. Mm -hmm. So um, it is easy to say a country has been grey listed, but actually, you know, for the purposes of understanding what one must do to carry out that extra due diligence, it is also important for them to understand why a country has been grey listed and whether their customer and the reasons why Malta has been grey listed, if there's any link between the two. Yep. And we know that obviously Malta has been grey listed um, on, on beneficial ownership related issues, um, which in, when it comes to the gaming industry is perhaps not so much of an issue. Um, since most customers obviously of gaming yep. institutions are natural persons themselves, you know. Yep. And the other issue is, is, is tax evasion, which is again, you know, not, not, not really um, sort of so much tied to the gaming industry itself. So these are always two things we say, you know, be open as possible, give information, be cooperative, mm -hmm. and also help them understand if there's anything that they need to understand. I think, I think it's a very relevant point. If, if we look at history, right, uh, last year Iceland was grey listed, right, and that, if you look at the report for that, one of the main reasons was because of the lack of clarity of ownership, right? The UBOs themselves weren't declared, and Iceland, credit to them, went through this massive um, uh, reclassification, right, of ensuring that all the, all the UBOs, and I think they got 96%, right, of, of all companies with properly documented um, ultimate beneficiary owners, which at the end of the day is one of the first proxies for ensuring that you have a clear set of anti-money laundering laws, and, and importantly also know your client, know your business. They only took nine months, right, in and out. And arguably, this was one of the quickest transitions in and out of grey listing. Where do you think we stand on that spectrum? Because it's important just to get some clarity, right? Because I, I, I get this all the time, right? How, how long are we going to remain inside, inside the grey listing zone? And I know it's how long is a piece of string question. But it'd be good, it'd be good to get, to get your, your, your insight as to where do we compare to the likes of Iceland, for instance, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well, first of all, I don't sound difficult, but it's really hard to compare two countries because obviously, you know, different countries have different right. um, sort of underlying issues. So, for example, Malta already has a beneficial ownership register in place. Mm -hmm. We've had it now for some time and it's been fully populated. Apart from having a beneficial ownership register, we also have a bank account register, which provides us with beneficial owner from ownership information so we can access you know, um, uh, banking information and beneficial, owner from beneficial ownership information in a matter of minutes, literally. So we have tools that have been in place, you know, um, now for some time, um, and yet still, you know, the FATF expects us to do more on beneficial ownership. So um, other countries that haven't been grey listed don't even have a beneficial ownership no. register. So this is why I was saying, you know, you can't really, it's not like a mathematic, you know, an exam of mathematics. So, um, but, so it's really hard to compare, but I think the Iceland, experience has shown us that it is possible, you know, for a country not to spend years yep. uh, on the grey list. So, so, you know, that, that is important to, to recognize. Um, and therefore, looking at Iceland and looking at, you know, the work that is taking place in Malta, the action plan that we've given to, to, uh, to the FATF, uh, you know, on which we received encouraging feedback. Um, so hopefully with all the work and we're working flat out, it will not be a matter of years and it will be rather, you know, um, uh, less, less than that. So, so it's, it's really hard to say. I'm always really hesitant to say a date because we can't. I mean, just like, you know, um, it was very difficult for us to anticipate that we would actually be grey listed. Mm -hmm. You know, learning from that experience, you know, it is always, listen, let's, let's not count our chickens until they hatch, but let us work diligently and as hard as possible to make sure that it's a matter of months and it's not a matter of years, I really. I agree with that, because then the implications might be hard, and we'll yeah. talk a bit about that. Russell, one, one of, pr presumably, right, one of the biggest uh, loads fall, falls onto auditing, right? Auditing and compliance, right? And automatically, I would assume, right, that the auditing team becomes the enemy of the people, right? Because they end up asking all these horrible questions, right, about everything about this transaction. Is, is that the case, right, with an auditing firm? Are you going through this process at the moment? Discuss. I, th I, th <laughs> I think um, inevitably, as a result of the points that, that Alfred's also highlighted, the FIU had to be seen to be um, raising the bar and some of the checks, and even when it comes down to enforcement and acting on certain shortfalls. Um, in terms of the checks post the grey listing itself, they haven't changed that much, but yes, of course, there is a lot more scrutiny, whether you're looking at AML audits or whether you're looking at external audits. So yes, then sometimes there are challenges, I would say particularly pre-2015, 
gray listing and when you are kind of trying to explain and manage clients' expectations that there are certain measures we are having to do over and above in order to safeguard yourselves, ourselves, and the country as well at large. And until that is fully acknowledged, um, that does take a little bit of going back and forth to mm -hmm. try and explain, because yes, when you have additional resources going in for an external audit to challenge things from an AML perspective, that wasn't part of the in initial brief from an external audit, mm -hmm. but it is a requirement, and it should be seen as strategic then as well, not just for Malta, but even for operators that are looking to uh, grow into new pastures, particularly if we're looking at the likes of the US. Well, if, if you look at a, a normal M&A transaction, right, you actually have to do a lot of due diligence if you're a buyer. You do, you do end up having to pop the books on a lot of things, actually even audited accounts, right, and audited reports, and actually then have to qualify or even, even reopen a lot of a few issues that might have been signed off. Angelo, what is your experience with that? Obviously, you've sold businesses. Um, how have you seen the, the kind of the audit process when you get to a transaction, and is that a kind of a deja vu as to what we're going through right now because of, of additional... In, in fact, m and was a very good, uh, you know, three for, yeah. for, for the due diligence. So to, to be honest with you, I don't think that anything changed because of the gray listing or not. You still have to do due diligence yeah. whether you like it or not. And I think, to be honest with you, there is a bit of positivity in this in that if the country actually does improve and actually puts the, you know, all the measures in place, I think that we will actually be a better jurisdiction as a result. I think my only kind of concern is that yeah, in typical multi fashion, sometimes people tend to over do it a little bit. So you sometimes get, you know, questions, you know, transferring, uh, say, for example, an actual example, like transferring an amount of money from your own account to your own account, yes. and you get asked about, I mean, yeah, it's like from the same person to the same person. So I think maybe we need to kind of um, not overdo it. Um, I think this is an area where AI actually does help. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that I've been working on actually is on the regulation uh, and the compliance aspect is where you can automate a lot of the, you know, the tedious work that you're faced with in complying with maybe things that are not really um, so anomalous and just flagging up what you should actually concentrate on. So I think this is an area where IT, AI can actually help a lot in reducing the burden of compliance, especially on, you know, I believe that a lot of actors in, in the country and actually worldwide are acting in good faith, but you know, there is always that small percentage that you need to flag and, and uh, look at. I I think looking, looking, and even just giving my own experience about certain transactions that are, that are of businesses that are being sold now, I think you're right. I think there's a certain element right now of, of too many false positives, right? At some point, that things are being flagged, um, audit teams just being a little bit overtly cautious or sometimes too alarmist, right? And, and, it, does, and it does stall processes, let, let's be clear. I think, I think we're going to an element of CYA, cover your ass, right? This, this, is, this is what's going through. And look, I think that is actually justifiable. We've been grey-listed, and nobody wants to be be caught holding the baby, right? When they say, "Okay, who did the DD on this?" Right? This is there's this really well-known case right now with uh, with an uh, with a SPAC in the US, right? Where uh, where a tech company was sold, and they didn't really disclose the, where their traffic was coming from. It was coming from grey-listed areas, grey-listed as in traffic as opposed to in finance, right? But that in itself has led to a lawsuit. So nobody wants to be caught in, in that audit, right? So I, 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 get, I get the element of alarmism, but I also recognize that this is an opportunity for automation. I think this is where AI or, I mean, Xero is a case in point. I love Xero, right? Xero is good because it's an accounting standard. Uh, you plug it into your bank and there's, there's no ambiguity, right? You can just give it to an auditor or, or compliance and the point is it's there and it's, it's a bit like the blockchain. It's immutable, right? The point is it's there. And I think, it gives us an opportunity, right, to use our tools and processes in a way that we haven't done before. In fact, I would argue that this is one of the advantages, right, or le let's call it an upside, a silver lining of us being in the grey zone. We have an opportunity to get our ship in order, right? What other possibilities are there? What other opportunities are there for us whilst we're over here? Is there any opportunity for us to get more efficient? AI is one of them, right? W what else could we do whilst we're here? Be good to get your insight here. No, I, mean, I completely agree actually on this point. I think from what we actually see from the examinations that we carry out, 
Um, we still see sort of too many instances where, where sort of the processes are still entirely manual, or as the systems that they are using are not advanced enough. Um, so there's definitely, you know, absolutely a lot of room for improvement for companies in Malta to invest in that area to sort of improve their compliance uh, and at the same time lower sort of, the, you know, the, the, the burden that has on the, on the entity itself. I mean, we always say, listen, you know, compliance is not just sort of there as, as a... As a, as a a killer to business. It's actually there to protect your own institution um, and, and sort of to ensure sustainability in the long, sustainability in the long run. Um, so there's definitely room room um, for improvement on that front. And also, with sort of what you're saying is yes, we do see as well instances where perhaps some entities are going overboard or mm -hmm. are doing maybe too much. And we're actually working on that front too, especially with banks in Malta, for example, where we have identified, yep. you know, a number of of, of, of um, areas that we can work with them to help them improve how they are to apply due diligence in practice um, using a more risk-based approach, we see instances where um, sort of certainly the approach is maybe not risk-based enough. And we understand as well their position, you know, that they're obviously terrified that, that maybe we come and knock, their door, knock at their door and just find, you know, things instances of non-compliance, so they want mm -hmm. to make sure that they're, you know, covered completely and that they don't have any instances of non-compliance. So we're trying to, to balance by providing guidance, having meetings with them, providing case studies and actual examples where we believe, you know, that maybe they didn't need to um, uh, sort of ask for all that information or bother the customer with this, this and that. And it's just about, yeah. it's just about finding the right balance. I understand that this is maybe, you know, sort of a bit of a uh, cyclical process and now we've reached a point where, um, you know, business might be a little bit um, impacted by, by this amount of due diligence. Well, I just wanted uh, to, to, I just wanted to comment on, on, on this. I, I, I fully agree. And, and I, I wanted to point out because I, I work with uh, a lot of operators and, 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 and the very different levels of, of how they work. But it's a very professional industry in terms of, of many aspects. So, so you buy all the, the software from professional suppliers. You, you, you buy everything. But when it comes to compliance, it's often less professional and, and actually the AML regulation allows you to delegate, mm -hmm. uh, even though you keep the responsibility, it allows you to get de delegate and use professional tools for, 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 for you know, sorting uh, some of this. And I don't think it's, it's probably been used enough. I think uh, to add something though to, about the automation and the delegation, I think though we need to make sure that it is delegation, not abdication. Because yes. uh, a lot of automated tools uh, do not explain the basis, for example, for, the, for their decision, or how do you review the decision that has been made, or even worse, if you have a decision not to flag something, how do you prove the reason, the basis of why you have not Correct. flagged it? It's almost even worse than actually flagging it unnecessarily. So I think this is something of an open problem. The EU has also passed regulations, draft mm -hmm. regulations, um, on the use of automated tools, uh, which will probably be enforced in like the next two years. And I think it's actually an interesting opportunity there. Uh, I think one, one of the points is I, I love the idea of being able to leverage then technology then to help address certain concerns and ride with the times. I think we also need to be careful in certain instances of saying that's perhaps too much, even if there is a potential overreach. The reason why I say that, once again I link it to the US and you would see this, is that sometimes we think that we are talking within closed doors and this the things that are picked up in headlines on the New York Times and which aren't necessarily understood. So what do I mean? One of the things that we're talking about is, um, let's say, the FIU having to heighten certain uh, processes or expectations then when it comes down to classifying or clarifying certain things as risk. When we look at the UKGC, for instance, we know that they tend to take a bit of a risk-based approach mm -hmm. to being able to calculate, like prepaid cards we know is one of the areas that we look at. And so, Alfred, like you highlighted that what you're doing is like you're sitting down with industry and understanding. I think that this is a really important thing to do in tandem with that of technology because it allows you then to be able to fulfill your requirements and obligations and expectations on the world stage. But equally so, we need to understand what the end game is because if we pull something potentially too fast, my fear is that that may have a knock-on effect then for operators mm -hmm. then in other territories who are here. So I think there really is a, a balancing act. Tech plays definitely a key role. I, I, think, well. I think a framework is necessary. And look, there is a framework already. And specific with gaming, the MGA is quite clear on what is allowed and what isn't, right? The UKGC takes a more risk-averse approach, right? They are, prepaid cards is a very good example. But also in terms of the KYC that you have to go to just to get a license there, they are effectively have just stepped it up one notch at a time when arguably the UK is even more distant from the EU than if it ever was before. There needs to be this kind of common 
framework that almost is updated on a regular basis, right? Because we are working in changing worlds. But I think, I think one of the most vulnerable things, and this is what concerns me right now, both as an investor, but also as somebody who's effectively uh, Maltese, the biggest issue we have right now is our Achilles heel is banking, right? Banking is an issue here. It's always been an issue. It was an issue before. It's very, very vulnerable. And I'm, I'm concerned, right? And I, I would like your honest opinions about this. What will happen if we are not, great, we are not whitelisted, right, after a short period of time? I'd like to get your insights, starting with you, Angelo, because obviously you've been involved in, in investments. What would be the impact of actually being uh, uh, grey listed for a longer period of time? Where do you see the biggest issues arising, if that makes sense? I think that is when uh, we'll start having negative impact, actually, if it's grey listed for a very long time. Um, you can't really foretell w w what would happen, but I think it will not have a positive impact, of course. So, you know, I mean, the, the country has been, for example, Malta Enterprise have been very helpful mm -hmm. and extremely supportive yes. during this period. I mean, even from my own experience with my company, they've been very supportive. So, you know, there has been that extra help and possibly what happened has pushed them also to be even quicker and doing an even better job. Um, but yeah, of course, inevitably, I do hope that, you know, this period will be over shortly. I think if we don't, then yeah, I think that is when we may start having actually negative effects, real ones, not just perceived ones. But perception is also a very important part of the game. Alfred, what's your thoughts? Well, it's, <laughs> it's, um, as I said, it's kind of really difficult to anticipate what the long-term impact will be. Um, we've had discussions with other countries. Um, I think um, what I mentioned, it, but someone mentioned also the timing of COVID. So for other countries that have been real estate, it was sort of difficult for them to tell, you know, um, sort of what impacted COVID. the economy, whether it was COVID or whether it was grey listing. Um, we've spoken to some jurisdictions. They said they didn't really see a big difference, and you know, in the in, in, sort of in FDI and in um, the number of licensees and operators in the jurisdictions, they didn't really see sort of that. So there was a, an, you know, an exodus of, of institutions. So it's really hard to tell. Uh, so sort of, it is really, in a way, a pity because mm -hmm. um, the, sort of the main reason why the FATF lists a country is because um, the FATF considers that country to have you know, strategic deficiencies in their AMS-CFT framework. So it lists that country um, so that other countries and other entities and other jurisdictions are able to take that into account when you know, carrying out a risk assessment. It's not really, it shouldn't be you know, a sort of a naming and shaming, but in actual fact, you know, it does have an impact on the reputation of a country. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, at the same time, it's, sort of, it's kind of ironic, because when you think of it, when you look at what Malta has been doing over the past few years, Definitely, our AML CFT framework has improved considerably. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no doubt about yeah. that. You know, so if you look at what the institutions have been doing, the, the resources, the tools that they're using, the, the, you know, all the systems that have been put in place, the changes in the laws. So when we look at all that happened over the past few years, and you look at Malta as of 2018, which is actually when the on-site examination of Moneval took place, mm -hmm. and you know, it is in relation to strategic deficiencies that were identified at that time yep. that Malta has been relisted now. But between 2018 and now, 2021, a lot of improvements have taken place. So Malta's framework has improved. Mm -hmm. It is much better than what it was in 2018. And yet now we have been relisted because that is the process. Yes. But in actual terms, the risk posed by institutions in Malta and by people in Malta and by Malta as a country should be now, should be lower than it is, than what it was in 2018. Yeah. Yes. You know, the only thing that has changed now is that we've been grey listed. Mm -hmm. We've been put on the list. Yeah. So this is obviously now impacting the reputation of the country, whereas in actual fact, what's happening on the ground, things have improved. Yeah. So... <laughs> I think that, sorry. Um, I think that certainly the longer we're on it, the more adverse it would be, whether you look at banking, investment, cost of compliance, cost of transactions, if you're looking at... Um, you're right, from a, obviously from a technical perspective, over those 18 months we did fantastically well, and I think those strategic deficiencies that we're looking at kind of sit even beyond the technical side. And so three of the elephants, let's say, in the room are, of course, you look at uh, corruption allegations, you know, lack of enforcement on certain on certain aspects then, and making the headlines, being in the headlines then for the wrong reasons. And if we look at FATF and the, the key reasons as to their purpose, I guess, beyond that of AML and, and financing of terrorism is the integrity. 
side of things then for the for for for, for what we don't want to do right is increase the friction between a benevolent investor wanting to put money into a business right Absolutely. or a buyer right wanting to buy literally put money into a bank and take a company as a yep. result of that transaction and literally having a frustration in the process because of, of of the gray listing this is the thing that concerns me the most right that we kind of are caught out as a, as a result of this grey listing, which I, 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 think, I think you make some very good points around, around the fact that we are now sadly witnessing things that happened three years ago, right? I hope it doesn't take us three years for now because we made the changes now for this to happen in 2024. But I am concerned around the real adverse effects, right? Around the fact that we won't be able to get money into the country specifically on investments, right? But Malta Enterprise for all its good intents, right? We'll never be able to sustain the investment requirements of all the startups in Malta, right? And that's even before we talk about M&A. Morten, what's your experience with dealing with, with companies like this? No, but I, I wanted to follow up on what you said about the reputational damage because that's something we maybe haven't talked about here on an international uh, scale because uh, Malta is gambling and gambling is Malta, uh, basically. So when, when, rep when Malta has reputational damage, the gambling industry, by extension, has a, a, a damage of, of, of uh, reputation. And, and that's a problem because... You, you all know that the gambling is uh, is facing bad times in all over in Europe, especially Europe. Yeah. And 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 we are we're trying to 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 turn this image around as as gambling being a sustainable industry driven by respectable operators, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et um, and 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 we come from a place where many politicians see uh, you know gambling as as these money greedy people in a, in a tax haven uh, and now they're also grey listed uh, so uh, it's very unfair but but that so so it, it has a reputational uh, damage so so it's really really important for the whole gambling industry that uh, that uh, Malta also gets off the uh, you know the, the grey list as, as as soon as possible because of the double whammy of also gambling not being shown favorably because of regulation right now yeah, I mean, that's also one for MGA, right? At the end of the day, we are now dealing, sadly, with a more fragmented Europe where a license gotten in Malta isn't necessarily a passport for you to allow operating in Europe. Sadly, it is a double or a triple whammy then when you take into account that, unfortunately, we also have, have the grey listing. There's also another right, curveball, which is now this, uh, this minimum tax, uh, this global minimum tax threshold, right, of 15%. Angelo, you go first, because obviously this is going to be directly impacting yourself as a business. What, what do you think would be that material impact? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a bit inevitable, although I still believe that, you know, every sovereign country controls its own taxation system, but I think there is going to be this ganging up, and I don't, I don't think, I think it's inevitable, actually, to have this. Um, maybe it is time, you know, talking from a local perspective, maybe it's time also for, I mean, at the moment, local entrepreneurs have the situation in which they have a different treatment from anyone else, actually, who comes to Malta and sets up. Um, so I think it may not be a bad idea for Malta to actually consider putting a level playing field so that local entrepreneurs pay exactly the same rate of tax as anyone else who actually sets up a company here. I think this would actually have a positive impact and uh, you know it's something that I've been pushing for um, so far unsuccessfully um, but I do think that this is uh, an anomaly in Malta that actually perversely incentivizes local entrepreneurs to set up abroad and yes. to actually exit, um, yes. which is something that is sad to see, but this is the, yes. the end result. Um, I think that, you know, if everyone is though paying 15%, I mean, you know, then uh, it's going to impact um, Malta's attractiveness, I'm sure. I think this is much worse than actually the grey listing, in fact. And, uh, but I think that not that many countries would actually keep it at 15%. So in a way, I think that there are other ways of overcoming this. But yeah, I think it will have a much worse impact than, than anything else. Malta has always historically resisted tax harmonization, right? And this, is, this is not even a political thing. Malta has always said, no, every country should set its rules. And look, with small economies, there has to be this kind of flexibility. I guess now there's this great reckoning, right, where sadly because of the big tech giants, right, Malta isn't even a pawn in this, in this scenario. It is just a, a spectator. We have to get to this stage where uh, we, at the very least, need to acknowledge that there is a need for a global uh, minimum taxation. Russell, what's your experience, right? What, what, 
what do you think specifically on this? Because you audit a lot of businesses, you get involved on the M&As. What's your view on, on, the, on the taxation perspective? I think Angelo is right when he says it's, it's one less uh, reason to essentially be in, in Malta. I think it stresses the, the, the reason as to why we need to really be flexing our ecosystem and try and direct a number of reasons as to why Malta beyond that of the tax, because if you're going to be comparable to another territory that has other things or that can be easily replicated, then that will be uh, very challenging for Malta. I think, um, it's like what you say, Julian, um, uh, Malta has been also quite creative in the past with the way in which it handles things, and I wouldn't necessarily assume that um, Malta won't be creative on this occasion. Alfred, your perspective on, on taxation? Well, really, we don't have much of a perspective. So <laughs> <laughs> if there's a rate, there's a rate, you know, and, and if, if there's, um, therefore, and um, so sort of our, our focus is purely on, on AML, obviously, you know, um, tax evasion, so if we speak of tax evasion, um, that is, you know, considered to be one of the predicate offences that can give rise to um, the money laundering offence itself. Um, but on the rate itself, we, we don't have a say, we don't have a view, you know, um, I mean, obviously, you know, I have my own views, I completely understand, you know, um, uh, what, what, what Angelo and, um, and Russell have said as well, and I sort of, I um, agree with those points too, so, but otherwise, you know, um, we're, we're focused on this, and has there been a crime or no crime? Uh, obviously, the rate is important, yes. because, <laughs> but otherwise, you know, whether it's 15 or, 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 or any other rate, um, we're, we're sort of a bit neutral on that point, really. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Unless there's any other questions, I'd like to start taking some, some closing notes. Morten, starting with yourself, you're obviously the, the, the external observer in this regard. What advice would you give us and Malt in general to be able to pull ourselves out of this sooner rather than later? Now it seems like the process has started, so, so, so as, as, as soon as, as possible that, that, that this, uh, this process is, is closed, the better. Um, I don't know if there, are, if there are further steps that can be, uh, that can be done um, by now. It's, I, I see the authorities are working uh, hard on this. So, so um, but, uh, but yeah, just, just knowing, and I, I know that Enrico uh, works uh, with the association too in, 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 in improving the, uh, the image of the industry and of, of, of Malta, and that's important for all of us. I think you said it, uh, Julian, we're all in the same boat. Yes. Um. Angelo, your, your perspective from an, an investor's and an entrepreneur's angle, how can we uh, improve our situation right now? Well, I think that, uh, you know, focusing on compliance, actually, you know, making sure that uh, we comply, basically, and that everyone plays along. I think that is the, the best way to get out of it. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think businesses, especially from like a startup perspective, uh, you need to keep flexibility, basically. So, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you do have to plan and have a little bit of a plan B, just in, in case, you know, things do overextend. So that is something you always have to be prudent about. But I think that overall, again, there is always an opportunity in this. So the opportunity to use technology better, to become more efficient, to introduce better processes. I think this is something that, you know, at least there, something good can actually come out of it. Russell, your thoughts? I think, as, as we said, we need to identify and, and come to terms with the strategic uh, deficiencies. I think we need to... Um, have some camaraderie and kind of nationalization to be able to tackle this all together as a, as a territory. I think, like what you're saying, I think everyone should be used to, familiar with the regulations and the terms. I think that's a, apart from Iceland as well, where they commented that even their grandmothers know what AML is now. Yes. <laughs> um, I think having a whistleblower system in play to be able to shout out about things that should be shouted about, should, should mm -hmm. be in play at, at a number of different angles. Um, and I think demanding um, rightful action from authorities when, when things need to be done um, properly, I think that that's something that we should be doing all as a unity. Alfred, last but not least. <laughs> it's a bit tricky, there's a lot to say actually. So, well, I mean, um, first of all, I completely agree with what's already been said. So we're, we're all in this, in this you know, it's uh, obviously um, there's a lot of work for the authorities to do, so yeah. I mean, the authorities are, are, are working flat out, especially us, the motor business registry and, and the police and the tax authorities are working together, you know, to um, work on all the actions that we need to implement as soon as possible. Um, but we're all in it together as well, so I completely second what Angela has said. We, we, you know, I mean, entities in Malta need to be sure that they are compliant. I mean, 
Um, uh, and actually, on that point, it is very important to volunteer information as well. So, you know, this is good practice. If you have, you know, important stakeholders in our jurisdictions, you know, just not wait for them to come to you and ask you, so what are you doing? But maybe if it, it is useful for, for entities in Malta to approach stakeholders abroad and let them know what they are doing, mm -hmm. what their compliance program looks like, how seriously they are about compliance, you know, so that, you know, um, they put their minds at rest that, um, you know, the, the, their clients in Malta are, are, are above things. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind where we, you know, where we, are, where we are today. It's true we are grey listed, but we have been grey listed on very specific issues mm -hmm. as well. And when we were evaluated in 2018, the report was published in 2019, uh, Malta had nine sort of uh, pillars under the whole framework that needed to be addressed, where we essentially where we failed mm -hmm. because we obtained a moderate rating of effectiveness or a low rating of effectiveness. And in those nine, seven of them have been addressed. So now where we are today is only in relation to two, and actually from those two pillars, only specific issues have been identified. So, and I say this because, you know, we can look at what we've achieved over the past few years, and where we are now, and therefore I think this is also useful for us and for our stakeholders and for foreign institutions abroad to understand, therefore, what are Malta's issues, fine on beneficial ownership, and the other one is on taxation, and, and we're expected by the FATF to demonstrate, you know, an increase in, in the number of, of um, tax-related money laundering cases that are being processed in Malta. Um, but there are very specific issues, and actually there are very few issues compared to the whole, you know, list of recommendations that we had to work with following 2019. So I think, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We're yeah. working hard, we're working seriously. We've had encouraging, um, you know, positive feedback from, from the FATF. Um, and we all need to work together, essentially, so, yeah. I agree, and those are going to be my closing notes. It's, it's tempting, when you're involved in this, it's tempting to think that things have been changed, right? But they have. I mean, the, the EY report is a kind of the first signal, right, that not all is right. Now, how do we get out of this? We, we have to get out of this. This is not something that we need the authorities to do. We as industry leaders have the obligation, right, to encourage, to show, to demonstrate, maybe whistleblow as well, but the point is we have to educate, right, the industry to show that there is a best practice approach. Now, whether it's automation, whether it's better tools and processes, right, whether it's, uh, whether it's just a knowledge transfer sometimes about what works and what doesn't, it's on us to pull us out of the grey listing phase. And if we do that, we can, we can do an Iceland, if that makes sense. And on that note, I want to conclude. Gentlemen, I, I found this really, really interesting. Thank you very much for your expertise. Alfred, Morgan, um, uh, Russell, and Angelo. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well, and thank you very much. Thank you.